Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. We are in our series, Building Bridges, <clears throat> and I want to go ahead and say something before we jump into John chapter 4 and read together today, <clears throat> that I do not have my head in the sand. I am not naive, nor am I ignoring the conflict in our nation right now by preaching on a series called Building Bridges. It almost seems like unrealistic, you know? A little hard to do. And I will say that building bridges is not easy right now. Would you say that would be easy? To build relationships with others that you're not used to connecting with or, or don't know for the sake of the gospel. I would say that it may appear that this looks impractical right now, but, or, or maybe even like out of touch, but I do not believe that's the case. I believe from a godly perspective, building bridges right now is, is, a, is a perfect series right on time. This series can help us keep our bridges intact, our relationships with our neighbors, friends, coworkers, and even enemies. I believe this series is meant to help us not burn bridges that we already have or the ones we barely have. And I think it's also meant for us to courageously build bridges in the midst of conflict. And we'll get into the scripture so I can show you. So I just want you to know, I, I do not think that this is an irrelevant series right now. I actually think it's critical. It's critical that we work on unity. It's critical that we work on coming together. And uh, I have to say this, that God's will is, is for me as a follower of Christ not to focus on the hysteria, the fear, or the panic of our world right now. If our nation is to go up in flames, quote unquote, then guess where you're going to find Pastor Ryan? Snatching people out of the flames. Because I like to do something called robbing hell. Because there's way too many people going there, and there's way too many souls there. And so in the midst of the chaos and conflict, I want to rob hell of souls and bring him into the kingdom of God. <laughs> Maybe you've never heard it that way, but I'm not a thief, unless it's pulling people out of hell. I personally do not think that Jesus would hide right now if he was here on earth. Because here's the reality. I'm pretty sure that in scripture I see that Jesus said, love our enemies and save everyone. Anyone who's willing to believe. The other two options right now in our world is to sit around and do nothing or contribute to the division. And I don't like those options. So I'd rather take time to build bridges and connections with people that have souls. Do you understand where I'm coming from? So with that said, let's open up our Bibles to John chapter 4. And we're going to find out that that's actually the same heart that Jesus has. And so I'm not saying anything new. I'm just agreeing with Jesus and what he would do. And John chapter 4 is a fantastic scripture on teaching of how to build bridges with the lost and those who are very different from us. And we're going to read through it. And I'm going to teach through it. And so verse 1, John chapter 4, verse 1, I'm using New Living Translation. It says this, Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. He had to get, in order to get to Galilee, he had to cross through Samaria. But here's the thing. The Greek word here used for had to go, because the New Testament, the majority of it is written in Greek, 
It actually means an imperative, a necessary trip. In other words, Jesus had a mission to Samaria. He eventually came to the Samaritan village called Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, ready for this, tired. Jesus gets tired. Tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. Now you may be wondering then, how do we have this story? If, how is John writing this story if Jesus is alone with a woman? Well, there's a few theories, but the two main ones is, is that the Holy Spirit guided John on what to teach. But a more practical one is that Jesus filled in these stories with his disciples as he lived for three and a half years or so, teaching them and telling them what took place. They probably asked questions like, how did that happen, Jesus, when they got back to hang out with him? So the woman, verse 9, was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? And I'll get into the division of that as I go to apply this later. Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoy? So notice that Jesus brings in a spiritual element to her life and she doesn't get it. She's thinking physical. And then she regards Jacob's well so important that she's like, what do you think you're better than Jacob and his well? She has no idea who she's talking to yet. You know what I mean? Like if she knew who she was talking to, she may have not have said that. Verse 11 says, or I'm sorry, verse 13 says, Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. And that's fresh life. That's Jesus. That's eternity. That's forever Christ in you. Satisfaction. Life abundantly is what we're reading here. So let's keep going. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again and I won't have to come here to get water. She's still thinking physical, literal water, isn't she? She doesn't get it. And Jesus turns the conversation. Now, let me put it this way, too. John doesn't have all the details and the length of the conversation in this one chapter. So when we read these things, we might think that this is exactly how it went down, but the reality is John's recording key moments in here. So there's, there's a, a possibility that really there was 30 minutes of conversation going on, and John just put these words down in writing as he was led by the Holy Spirit to have put down. And this is what Jesus does to turn this conversation, and it gets real. And I don't recommend this, just so you know. Unless God divinely orchestrates you to get to this point. But I just want to clarify that there may be other conversations going on before this that's not recorded. And Jesus has a word of knowledge. Okay, now let me explain that real quick before I read the rest. In 1 Corinthians 12, there's the gifts of the Spirit that the church has to edify one another and to build each other up. And one of them is to have a word of knowledge, so to know something that only God and that person would know, but a third party could know it and speak it to confirm that God is listening and answering your prayers and trying to connect with you, speak to you, communicate with you. Well, Jesus, also full of the Holy Spirit, operates in the Spirit too. While he is fully God, he's also fully man. And before he could start his ministry, he had, to be, he had to have the Holy Spirit in him and fill him. And so he did. And we see that at the water baptism. We also see that from the temptation of Jesus in the desert, that he was full of the Holy Spirit. So 
with all that said, he goes and says this to this woman. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. She says, I don't have a husband. Wait a minute, did Jesus get that wrong? No. He goes on to say, you're right, you don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands. And you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. See what I mean by maybe that's not the conversation we want to have with someone right away? Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. And she turns the tide again. She turns the conversation and she goes, tell me, why is it that you Jews insist? Notice she brings up the division, not Jesus. Notice she brings up the division. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worshiped? And Jesus replied, he said, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. He starts to bridge the gap. But he does make a claim that the Jews, ready for this? Verse 22, you Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. He bridges that, and he brings that up because he is the one coming through. He is the one from the Jewish nation that's coming to save. But the time is coming, ready for this? This is powerful. The time is coming, indeed, it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way, for God is spirit, and so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. What he's saying here is it doesn't matter what geographical location or what building you worship in, if you don't worship here soon, Jesus' life was going to do this. Jesus' life was going to break down barriers in worship. It wasn't going to be about where you worship. It was going to be about who you worshiped because you have Christ in you. You can worship anywhere you want. Now, you can worship in your car, but make sure you keep your eyes open. You can worship in your backyard if you want. You can, like David, taking care of the sheep. He wasn't in the temple and he worshiped God. He already figured it out. We don't have to go to church to worship. Church is icing on the cake for worship. And, and there's a point to that. And by the way, I solely believe in attending church so we can be there for one another. We can worship as one corporate body together. But when we put it in a little tiny box and say, that's when I worship, we've, we've missed Jesus. We are capable of worshiping. If God, by the way, if God was that small, he wouldn't be God. If God was that small that we can only worship him from an hour and 15 minutes in a building, then he is really small. He's not God. And God forgive us for making him that small, for making you that small. Wow. We can worship him in spirit and in truth. You know what Jesus is doing here? He's not making it about Jews or Gentiles or Samaritans. He's making it about Jesus. He's bridging the gap. He's bridging the, the division. He's, you know what he's doing? Not only did he have a, he's having a conversation, now he's clarifying misconceptions. And I believe that God has called us to do that, to clarify misconceptions in our world about Jesus, about the word of God, and even about Christians. We'll get into that more as the series goes on. By the way, uh, yesterday, God reminded me of uh, one of the messages I wanted to do in this series I had forgotten. And I'm just being completely transparent with you. And I was hanging out with my wife, and I realized, oh, my goodness, one of the sermons I wanted to do was how to disagree without killing each other. We're going to get into that. Does that sound good? Did you know you can do that? Did you know that you could disagree without destroying someone or their property or something? Isn't that interesting? It's going to be a really important message. And I'm praying whether it's next week or the week. So I'm going to keep you kind of hooked and see which one you come to. Like, you know. Either you're going to come next week or you're going, to, you're going to tune in online, whatever it may be, okay? But it's coming as God leads because you can actually disagree and treat each other with respect and, and dignity. So we're headed there. And that's what Jesus did. So verse 25 says, the woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. That's interesting. She has some knowledge. She's in Samaria. She's not even in Judea or Galilee. 
dominated by the Jews. She has an idea of Jesus. Someone has taught her. So then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Now, in our chronological Bibles, in the order of chronological of Scripture, you ready for this? This is the most that Jesus has ever exposed his deity to anyone. And he chose to expose it, his true identity to a woman. And he did it alone. Now, why is that significant? Let me go ahead and get into one of the barriers that Jesus is breaking down in this story. Because we're talking about today, the title of the sermon is Bridges Over Barriers. Or you can say Through Barriers. It was not correct or socially acceptable to the Jews, especially for a rabbi or teacher, to speak to a woman in public. To be seen in public with this woman, from what we have learned from writings passed down through time in Jewish history, that he would lose all credibility for doing this. Jesus is breaking down the cultural barrier that women can't learn from him, from people. Jesus is restoring the true place and importance and value of women in a culture that demeaned women. Now, I don't say that to get a pat in the back from all the ladies in the room. I'm just teaching what Scripture is showing us. That women were highly important to Jesus, and he's trying to teach his disciples who grew up in a society that treated them badly and poorly to value them and to make sure they know the truth of Jesus Christ. And we're going to find out why in a moment, why it was important as she knew. So ready for this? Verse 27, just then his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman. But none of them had the nerve to ask. That was wise of them. What do you, what do you, what do, you do? Or what do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone. Now let's stop right there because if we read this on our own time in our house, drinking some coffee, we may miss something extremely important here. She dropped her physical need because she met the most important need of her life. Wow. 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 Come on, go ahead and say it. Wow. <laughs> That's huge. This is what Jesus was trying to accomplish. She, okay, she was thirsty, so was he. He was thirsty. But guess what was more important in this moment? A spiritual soul, a soul that needed him. But not just her, an entire village, an entire city. Wow. So what does he do? He gives her what's more important. He's giving himself to her to change her life. And she drops this physical need to go tell everyone something better, something greater. And here's the thing, church, you're going to be in a place where all you think is physical. I'm hungry. Hurry up, bring the food already. But your waitress needs the living water of Jesus Christ. You may be at work and your boss is getting on you, but your boss doesn't know the living water of Jesus Christ. Do you get where I'm going? Your neighbor may be a different color than you, a different nationality, a different political side than you, but do they have the living water of Jesus Christ? Something is more important, and that's eternity. And Jesus is showing us what to value more than anything else right now. Praise God. Praise God. So, she left her jar. Verse 29 says, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? She went to the village and said that. So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Meanwhile, this is what takes place. The disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something, please. But Jesus replied, I have, kind of, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. Now he's getting ready to school his disciples. 
He's going to mess up. He says some weird stuff, and then they're like, huh? Is there a Panera around this well or something like that? We just traveled this entire time to go get you food, and you're not eating, man. He's like, priorities, guys. Priorities right now. Priorities. Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. They're like, did someone bring him food while we were gone? Verse 34, then Jesus explained, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who set me and from finishing his work. You know the saying. Now, this is huge. Four months between planting and harvest, but I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. You know the saying, one plants and another harvest, and it's true. I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others had already done the work, and now you will get to gather the harvest. Others did the work, right? Now they get to gather the harvest. Well, check this out. You ready for this? You know what he was saying there? Is you're finishing the construction of those bridges. You're going to see an entire village come to me because someone before you took the time and the hard work and the patience to build a bridge, to preach the gospel. Church, don't quit when you feel like it's all over and it's not working because you may be finishing the bridge. Some of us are so overwhelmed by the idea that I have to start brand new construction. I just got the drawing plans. What we don't realize is every time we go out, we may be finishing the bridge. Someone's already labored. The reason why I'm here today is because my parents labored. The reason why I'm here today is because there's church members in here that invested in this church, not just money, but time and efforts and work. And we're here today, pastor always says that we're sitting in the seat of someone else's sacrifice. It is our job to take the baton and carry it forward. And that does mean financially, that does mean physically, that means serving, that means reaching our community. Pastor Kuhn loved this community. Pastors spent so much time outside these walls trying to reach the loss. Let me tell you something about Pastor Kuhn. Pastor Kuhn cared so much about the loss, this was not his favorite place in Delaware, just in case you didn't know that. His favorite place was outside these walls where it was dark and they needed the light of Jesus Christ. This, this building, it helps us do what we're doing right now. It helps us with all the youth group and, and the kids programs and the nursery so that we can be fed in this moment. Because by the way, it was one moment at youth group that changed my life forever in that building next door. Do not discredit your kids going to kids' church or youth church, it only takes one moment to change their life. I was called into ministry because of one moment at the altar of that building over there. Why am I saying all this? Because we don't realize people are doing all this work beforehand so that we could take it and finish it. And that's exactly what the end times is about. When Jesus comes back, he's going to go ahead and put that last piece of concrete on that bridge and it's going to be over and all who believe will cross and all who's, who don't they won't and all the laboring you did all the giving you did all the serving you did was not in vain praise God that's encouraging he said you're going to have a harvest we're going to harvest all these people because someone did the work before you Look what happened next, verse 39. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus. And by the way, can I, let me stop for a second, because I know Pastor Kuhn would not like this. It wasn't just Pastor Kuhn. It was the entire church working together. Please don't get me wrong. God gave him a vision. The church believed in that vision to make disciples of all nations. Thank God for diversity. Thank God for this church leading the way in that way. But Pastor couldn't do it without everyone in this room. And that is the same story today. It doesn't change. Verse 39, many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. Wow, she became a bridge for an entire 
town to come to heaven and to come to Christ. Wow. Who knows? Who knows what's going to happen this week when you need a cup of coffee? Jesus just needed a cup of water. Now, here's the thing. He had a plan. The Greek word said to go to, to Samaria. He had a plan. We do too. There is someone lost in every town, in every restaurant, in every place. Let's live on mission to build a bridge for the sake of souls. So let me give you a few things that Jesus did. I want to show you a map real quick. Because bridges over barriers has a lot to do with what we just read in this scripture. So check out this map of Palestine. This is what it looked like back then. We have Judea, where Jesus was. We have Samaria in the middle, and we have Galilee on top. Now, I don't want you to miss this. This is important. We're talking about geography here. I'm not a big fan of it. This is important. So if Ryan's bringing this up, it must be important. Okay? All right. Calculus and geometry, not my thing. This is what the Jews would do. They would always take a journey around Samaria by going east towards Peria, the green area. They would go over the Jordan River. They would travel up the right side, the east side of the Jordan River, which is between Samaria and Peria, the green and the blue. So they would go to the right. They would travel up, go through the Decapolis, and then back into Galilee to get to Galilee. Why? That's how much these two countries or these two towns hated each other. 400 years of conflict. Why? The Samaritans were a mixed race. When the Assyrians took over this area, they left some people there. Some people chose to stay. Well, the Jews at that time intermixed with Gentiles, and the Jews despised that. They couldn't see past it. So there the division began. The Jews wanted to rebuild the temple. The Samaritans offered to help. The Samaritans said, nah, we're good. We don't need your help. So the Samaritans did what? They built their own temple in Gerizim to worship. It was race that divided these two nations. And yet Jesus told Abraham, the one that he promised would be a, a, a man of many nations. Do you see what happened? They missed it. And I'm not trying to bash Jews. I'm just saying these people missed it. Abraham would be a blessing to all nations, all races, all people. And Jesus is like, it's time to fix the issue here. It's time to go through Samaria, fix the brokenness, build a bridge, instead of traveling an extra three days to go around into Galilee. Wow. That's another wow moment. Praise God. Jesus is teaching his disciples to quit avoiding and start embracing and building a bridge. Do you know it would take three days to go from Judea to Galilee if they went through Samaria? It takes six to seven days if they travel east of the Jordan River. That's how much they couldn't stand each other. And Jesus was like, it's time to stop. It's time to grow up. And it's time to start seeing that we all belong in the kingdom of God. And so he started building a bridge because he was thirsty. And because there was a woman there, he didn't even pick the person who knew the word of God. Just in case you counted yourself out once again on week three of this series, he used a woman who had a sinful lifestyle. Let's talk about that for a second. Not only is he breaking a cultural barrier, now he's breaking a religious piety barrier of being around one of the most sinful women of that town. We're talking about the most holy person in the world is next to a notorious sinner. That, too, would discredit his validity and credibility with his disciples. But he said, no, 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 no. No, no, no. She is a child of God. She belongs in the kingdom of God. That's what he's trying to teach them. That all mankind, I've come for all mankind, not just one race. He's building a bridge. And that bridge would later be seen through, through the disciples. Beautiful. It's beautiful. There was the cultural barrier of men and women in public. 
I still don't think it's wise for men to pursue women by themselves and to try to preach the gospel. That's not the case here in this story. That wasn't going to be the case. I think there is still boundaries that we need to have as men and women, okay, just so you know. But with Jesus here, he's able to do what he's doing because he's perfect. He's a pure human being and God at the same time. So we see a racial barrier being broken down with Samaritans and Jews. We see a cultural barrier with men seen in public with women. And we see a sinful barrier being broken down because Jesus is holy and perfect, but seen in public with a sinner. Now, Peter would appreciate this because Peter himself was a sinner. When Jesus called him to come follow him, and he caught a bunch of fish in Luke 5, we see the story. Do you know what happened? He, Jesus helped him catch a bunch of fish. And he says, this is the words, I quote, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, get away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. So Peter would be reminded of the story. If he, if he was there, maybe he remembers, oh, I remember when Jesus welcomed me. Jesus welcomed me to follow him. So how does Jesus break it down? Let me start closing the sermon with this. Jesus broke it the barriers down because he breaks the usual MO. Jesus breaks the usual mode of operation. And instead of going around, instead of voiding, he says, we're going to build and reach these people. So we're going through Samaria. You're going to have to, you're going to have to face the people that you don't like. Mm. Mm. That's, that's uncomfortable. Secondly, He's teaching them, his, his disciples, to love everyone. He's clarifying misunderstandings. Instead of avoiding, he's embracing. He showed the disciples that day that even your enemies can be in the kingdom of God. What else does he do? He asks for water. Here is the one who doesn't need anything, but he does because he lowered himself and humbled himself to identify with us by needing water too, by being fully man, fully God. Where, where am I going with this? Church, we can't be so high and mighty that we don't need anything. One thing that keeps us equal in this world is we all need physical water to survive. And what Jesus is showing us here is that we all need the living water to make it and survive as well. I said something at 9 o'clock. I don't know if I'll be able to spit it the way I did then but let me get it out. The devil knows, he knows that the most important factor in our world right now is the living water, not the physical. So what is he doing? Let's be cultural warriors and wise right now. You ready? I want to, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. The devil will use physical things to divide the nations. Physical conflicts. Why? Because the spiritual need of every human being needs Jesus. He's like, you know what? Ooh, you know, what would keep the Christians from being busy sharing the gospel? Ah, political division. Mm-hmm. That's how slick he is. Oh, you know, what's going to... What's going to make them not focus on helping others? Oh, I know. They have a haughty view of themselves, and they're better than every other sinner in the world. Somebody puff up their pride like they don't do anything wrong. You see where I'm going? That's what the devil's up to right now. <laughs> Let's expose it. That's the truth. If he can get us distracted with the physical things of this world, we won't focus on the eternal life of our world, of our of the people in this world that need Jesus. We see here in scripture that the eternal life matters more than anything. So what should we do? Here's some takeaways that I got from this scripture as I studied it and as I read it, just reading the scripture without commentaries, without some other people, here's what I see. Tension and conflict is uncomfortable. Building bridges will put you in uncomfortable situations. But here's the thing. That discomfort is meant to possibly build, because I say possibly because it doesn't always work. I'm not going to be that naive. Not everyone will agree with you. 
And we'll get there on this in the series. That discomfort that you're feeling, the discomfort you're feeling in this world right now, we can't avoid it. We need to work on it to bring peace. We are meant to go through some uncomfortable times so that we do something to build peace. I know that's deep. I don't have time to unpack that, but understand where I'm coming from is that it's not going to be easy, but the end result is peace, and so it's worth it. In order to make a difference, we have to value people who are different from us. That's what Jesus did. In the midst of national tension, choose to build bridges instead of more barriers. Please, please. Here's an important one. Followers of Jesus, follow the example of Jesus. Don't follow media. Don't follow even your own inclinations, your own desires. Make sure you check those real quick with Jesus before you go out the door in the morning or before you click post. Next thing you know, you're online all day trying to explain yourself. You know what I'm talking about. Careful, careful. Followers of Jesus follow his example. It's hard, you ready? It's hard to build barriers when you're busy building bridges. Mm. Just focus on what we're supposed to do. You can't be blamed for the wrong. Now, as we go along this series, you ready for this? Christians will do what we're supposed to do and people will still agree, disagree with you. That's coming. I'm not that naive, trust me. We all need water and we all need Jesus, the living water. And lastly, this is so important. Thank God we're recording this right now. And all these notes are on calvarydover.org forward slash grow if you want to share or read them again. My takeaways here, ready? There's never a time to build a barrier between Jesus and our community. Jesus came for everyone. There will be time for boundaries and barriers for certain things to protect you and your family from corruption of sin and all those things. But there's never a time in the Bible where we're supposed to build a barrier between Jesus and the lost. We're supposed to break down those barriers. We're supposed to build bridges. If you don't believe me, read John chapter two. What does Jesus do? Do you wanna know what happens if we put barriers between the community and Jesus, the lost, I'm talking about, and Jesus? Do you know what Jesus did? He flipped tables. In John chapter two, he started flipping tables because there was a barrier between worshiping God and all of those nations who gathered to worship. He's like, why do I hear the bleeding of animals here? And they were being oversold, they were being overpriced and overcharged, taking advantage of the people. He said, why is this house become a house of thieves instead of a house of worship? Let's not upset Jesus, you know what I'm saying? I don't wanna, I don't wanna upset Jesus. So I will never work at putting a barrier between Jesus and the lost. And sometimes our choices, our words can do that and we gotta stop. Because Jesus came for them too, not just us in this side of this church. This series is about sending you out to evangelize and reach the world. And it's gonna take hard work. It's gonna take love, patience, because Jesus came for women like her in this story. Different race or mix, whatever it is. He broke that down. Cultural issues that we deal with and sinful things. Let's close our eyes for a moment because in this room, you may feel like Jesus would never embrace you, never love you. Wrong. The story proves otherwise. Praise God that we read this story today. Jesus broke through eternity to come and say, I love you. And nothing that you've ever done Put them all together is still not greater than his love for you. He's either calling you home or he's chasing you down, looking for you. He's saying, please receive me. Please repent. Turn away. Turn away from that lifestyle. I will help you live a new one. You don't think you can do it? That's okay. I will help you do it. If that's you right now, would you just ask Jesus to come and change your life? Change your heart. Surrender to him transform me into the person I'm supposed to be. The one you died for. Because here's the thing. Jesus doesn't just save you from something. He saves you for something. 
to be a bridge builder, to go to the village and bring everyone in to say, come and see a man that has changed my life. God, I pray that you would call home those who are lost, those who are far from you. Lord, I pray that they would surround themselves today with other believers who believe and hear my voice today, that hear this message, the importance of loving the lost, loving the sinner, breaking through barriers. God, surround them with other followers of Christ who will help support them. Lord, help us to break down the barriers, to build bridges over if we have to, to break through if we have to. We follow Jesus and that's what he did. Lord, it's a very complex and difficult society we're living in right now. We need something really important. We need discernment. We need help to discern how to build in the midst of this chaos. Help us, God. Jesus, help us. Help us, God. You see our hearts today. You know that we care about this. You know that we're trying. And some of us feel tired. Some of us are exhausted from trying. And it doesn't seem to work. But God, we pray that you would send someone else to finish that bridge then. If it's meant to be built. If it's meant to happen, if it's meant to be crossed, God, you will send someone else to finish. We'll do our part, God. May we never quit doing our part because someone else may finish the work. We thank you, Lord, for this message today. Your word is alive and well. Thank you, God. Lord, we study it. We read it this whole week to spend time with you, to connect with you, to learn, to help us build bridges. We give you all the glory and praise for those who've come home to you today and those who will. In Jesus' name, amen.